My name is Mark Francis. I'm the president of Catholic Theological Union. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to this celebration of the wonderful gift of art by Janet McKenzie to Catholic Theological Union given to us by Barbara Marion and Jerry Powers. Five wonderful paintings in all, The Epiphany and Mary and the Midwives, uh, and the particular focus of this afternoon will be the refle reflections on the triptych, which is right here, uh, entitled The Succession of Mary Magdalene, a work that was commissioned, by, uh, commissioned of Janet McKinsey by Barbara Mary and herself. And she's going to speak to us a little bit about the creative process that went in to creating that, uh, that piece of art. Uh, like any good religious art, these paintings are not merely decorative. They are theological statements of the surprising and profound ways that God intervenes in our world. Holy women in general, and the figure of Mary Magdalene in particular, have long been neglected or misunderstood by Western art. This is a little Catholic factoid for you. The word maudlin, overly sentimental, drippy, is a contraction of Magdalene because of the way in which Mary Magdalene has typically uh, appeared in Western art. She's not maudlin here. The triptych along with the Epiphany and Mary and the midwives fills a gap in the imagery of the holiness of women that has long needed to be redressed. Mary Magdalene, usually portrayed as a repentant sinner, is very rarely uh, we depict it as a woman who was known as, as the apostle to the apostles, an active evangelizer whose preaching was crucial at the beginning of the church. The art of Janet McKenzie offers us a glimpse of holiness that is inspiring and which stretches our imagination. Thank you, Barbara and Jerry, for the magnificent gift of these paintings to Catholic Theological Union. They will help to shape the imagination of students and faculty and all those who visit CTU now and in the future, because they lead each person who sees them to rejoice in the expansive holiness of our God. And Barbara, would you like to come up and say a few words? I, <laughs> I kind of thought so. <laughs> Page one. <laughs> wow, it only took us 68 years to get here, and a blood moon and a lunar eclipse. <laughs> us, in this case, is the community that has graced my life. The artist, the scholars, the theologians, and the magi I have known those who listen to me going on and on on my soapbox about different things and still loved me. I'm of course including in the us all the little girls and the women who would say, yeah, when I or someone else would ask, where are the women? Where are we in this story? Where are we in these images of the sacred. The impetus to commission works of art depicting the feminine face of the divine, of the holiness and the agency of women in the scripture stories of the incarnation and of salvation, of the holiness and the agency of women was the ex experience I had as a five-year-old, gazing in rapture at the glorious and almost life-sized figures of the Nativity Crash in my home parish, Sacred Heart Parish in Appleton, Wisconsin. The magnificent wise men, 
the camels, the handsome servants, and the shepherds, and the cherubs, and that beautiful beckoning star. And I wondered, where are the little girls like me in there? Much later when I was grown and reading about some of these things, I discovered that many, many women wondered about this also, and that some of them, thank God, spent years studying why this was so and how it came to be. These women who shaped my thoughts and informed my feminism and nurtured my theology I am going to give you their names now, and perhaps you know these, some of these women better than I do. Rosemary Radford Ruther, Elizabeth Schuschler Fiorenza, Karen King, Jane Shaberg, Susan Haskins, Elaine Pagels, Diane Bergant, Ruth Fox, Carolyn Osik, Elizabeth Johnson, you know, the usual suspects. <laughs> and tonight, Barbara Reed, I cannot wait to hear everything you have to say. To me, their names are a litany of strength and light. And I'm so grateful for their thoughts, their scholarship, their years of careful research, their books and articles that set me free and offered a challenge. They all expressed over and over again in some way that the giftedness of women and our call to minister in this church must be made visible, no longer hidden or ignored and devalued. And so that little thought, that quiet little whisper grew in me over the years. What could I do? Is there anything I can do to show the face of the Holy One in the faces and lives of my sisters? A picture is worth a thousand words, but I can't even draw a stick lady. And I know next to nothing about art, art history, artists, or commissions. But, minus any sense of humility, I began looking for an artist who did. And I looked for 12 years. And then one day, in the year 2000, I saw this image and knew that my search was over. This, as many of you know, is Jesus of the people that brought Vermont artist Janet McKenzie into worldwide awareness, winning the National Catholic Reporter's global search for an image of Christ for the new millennium. And she returned my phone call. <laughs> <laughs> and we began a conversation and a friendship that continues to this day, and I wish so much that she could be here and you could meet her and talk to her she would love it, you would love it, but she's up there in the Northern Kingdom, just a couple miles from the Canadian border, painting. I am grateful and thrilled to report that Janet's inspired and powerful rendering of the Feminine Magi, entitled Epiphany, which you can see on the third floor, is second in popularity only to her Jesus of the people. And she knows that for sure because people call her and email her asking for permission to reproduce the image for all kinds of lectures and books and magazines and other uses. Very quickly, I want to thank a few more people from my community of support because we're here together this afternoon because of them. First of all, my mentor, model, a true Magi and good friend, Sister Dorothy Dwight. 
for her unflagging enthusiasm for Epiphany. She talked about this image. She showed reproductions of it to everybody she knows, about a thousand people. And her spirit lifted and sustained me through the next four commissions. It has always been my purpose, my hope, and my dream that women and girls and men and boys from all over the world might encounter these five paintings, and now they can because CTU is their new home. How in the world did this happen? Through the initiatives of some dear guides and companions of mine. My friend and colleague, composer and cantor, Jim Hansen, and our mutual friend, Virgil Funk, from the National Association of Pastoral Musicians, who knows for a long time now his colleague and friend, Ed Foley, who opened the door to Father Mark and this unique, important, and all-inclusive CTU. How perfect is this? How wonderful. I mean, celestial signs. <laughs> And finally, I am so grateful for the spirit and work of the three women here who were from the get-go, you should pardon the expression, over the moon, so excited that the paintings might be available, and who guided their every step from our home in Harvard, Illinois, to CTU. Nancy Nickel, Sam Bounds, and Susan Hickman. Thank you, thank you, thank you, ladies for your gracious assistance, your constant generous hospitality, your attention to every detail, and all the merry conversations we had with you over the last six months. And to my spouse of 52 years, Jerry, what more can I say? <laughs> Thanks so much. Uh, and now we, we turn to more of a both theoretical but also spiritual uh, discussion of, of these paintings in a certain sense. Um, I have the pleasure to introduce to you uh, Dr. Barbara Reed. She is a uh, Grand Rapids Dominican and she is academic dean and vice president here at Catholic Theological Union. She's wonderful to work with. I just thought I'd add that, Barbara, because. <laughs> but uh, she, she will speak uh, to us today about women in ministry, women at the heart of Jesus' mission. So, Barbara, thank you for being here. Thank you, Mark, and thank you all. And I would like to also add my expression of deep gratitude to that of President Francis, to Barbara Marion, and to Jerry Powers for their extraordinary gift and for making it possible for CTU to join them in reshaping our imaginations about women at the heart of Jesus' mission through the extraordinary art of Janet McKenzie. Of the many women who surrounded Jesus during his lifetime on earth and who participated in his mission in the early days of the Christian movement, I will highlight the two Marys that Janet McKenzie has depicted so powerfully for us and that Barbara and Jerry have given to us, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Jesus. As a biblical scholar, my main focus is what the New Testament says about these Marys. I will also comment on some of the images of them that have prevailed in Christian art. When President Mark Francis asked if I would speak today on Mary Magdalene, he teasingly suggested that I tell the story of Mary Magdalene's arduous journey from Palestinian prostitute to a life of luxury on the French Riviera. <laughs> 
we had a hearty laugh over it. But the fact is that such myths about Mary Magdalene, for which there is no biblical basis, still prevail in the minds of many believers. What the Gospels say about Mary Magdalene is finally starting to become better known. But if you ask most Christians who was Mary Magdalene, they will tell you she was a repentant prostitute, or that she was the one who wept at Jesus' feet and dried them with her hair, or that she was the woman who was caught in adultery and was about to be stoned before Jesus intervened. In the Gospels, none of these things are said of Mary Magdalene. Nowhere is there any reference to Mary Magdalene being a sinner, much less a prostitute. There is a story in Luke's Gospel in which a woman who had been forgiven many sins, the nature of which is not stated, weeps at Jesus' feet and anoints them with expensive ointment. But that woman is nameless. She is not Mary Magdalene. In the Gospels of Mark and Matthew, the anonymous woman who anoints Jesus is not said to be a sinner, but is shown as one who performs a prophetic act, anointing Jesus on the head, the way Samuel anointed Saul and then David as king. In the Gospel of John, Mary of Bethany, the sister of Martha and Lazarus, anoints Jesus' feet, and that is an act that Jesus says anticipates his burial. But none of these women is Mary Magdalene, nor is the anonymous woman in John chapter 8 who is about to be stoned. The confusion between these women and Mary Magdalene was reinforced by Pope Gregory the Great, who conflated them in an Easter homily in the year 591. Christian artists have also confused the various stories, which has helped to reinforce false images of Mary Magdalene. Paintings such as that of Titian depict Mary Magdalene as morosely repentant, maudlin, thank you, Mark, <laughs> half-clothed, I'm unclear about what the state of undress has to do with repentance, <laughs> or even portrayed naked as this painting of Quentin Metzis that mixes Mary Magdalene with a legendary woman, Mary of Egypt, who went to the desert to repent and whose hair covered her after her clothes deteriorated. For some reason, there is great fascination with the story of a sinner who repents dramatically, much greater fascination with that kind of a story than with the story of a woman who became apostle to the apostles. While there is no gospel evidence to support it, some still like to think of Mary Magdalene as the forgiven woman at the home of Simon the Pharisee, as in this painting by Rubens, or as the woman caught in adultery. And modern artists, such as the Chinese artist He Shi, still confuse Mary Magdalene with the anonymous woman who anointed Jesus. And on July 22nd, the Feast of Mary Magdalene, Catholic Blogspot put up this image, the one on the right, of uh, oh, the woman with ointment for Mary Magdalene. But the most extreme version of a myth about Mary Magdalene was recently revived by Dan Brown <laughs> in his book, The Da Vinci Code, where he advanced that Mary was pregnant with Jesus' child and went to France, where her descendants eventually founded the Merovingian line of kings. Brown's highly fictitious book depicts Mary, as, Mary Magdalene as the Holy Grail in Da Vinci's painting of the Last Supper, rather than the chalice from which Jesus drank. Now, as we look at Janet McKenzie's paintings, we find depictions that are refreshingly true to the gospel scenes that feature Mary Magdalene. The first panel, the one on the left, entitled Companion, Mary Magdalene with Joanna and Susanna, depicts the text of Luke 8, 1 to 3, where Jesus is making his way through the cities and villages, and this, these are Luke's words, proclaiming and bringing the, God, the good news of the kingdom of God. 
the twelve were with him, as well as some women who had been cured of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Herod's steward Chusa, and Susanna, and many others who provided for them out of their resources." End quote. This text of Luke's is the only one that tells us anything about Mary Magdalene prior to her following Jesus to Jerusalem, where she witnessed the crucifixion, saw where Jesus was buried, and found the tomb empty on Easter morning. All four Gospels tell that part of Mary's story, although each tells it slightly differently. Only Luke tells us of Mary and her companions prior to the crucifixion scene, and he only gives us a few scant details. He does not tell us how Jesus and Mary met, nor does he tell us whether she was married, widowed, divorced, or never married. It is unusual that a woman is named in the Bible without reference to her husband or father or son. Instead, what identifies Mary is the town from which she comes, Magdala. So if your Galilean geography is a little fuzzy, you can see where Magdala is there on the, on the Sea of Galilee. In Jesus' day, it was an important fishing town. And here you see a mosaic of a fishing boat from Magdala that dates to the first century. And still today, sardines are the most abundant fish caught in the Sea of Galilee. In the first century, they were smoked and salted at Magdala for export. And here you see recent excavations at Magdala, which is now becoming once again a popular pilgrim site. So perhaps Mary was involved in the fishing industry at Magdala, and maybe she met Jesus in a similar way as he did Peter, James, and John. That trio, who left all to follow Jesus, is mirrored in the three named in Luke 8, 2 to 3, Mary, Joanna, and Susanna, who accompanied Jesus as he preached the good news throughout the various cities and villages. Luke says that they had all been cured of evil spirits and infirmities, presumably by Jesus. Mary had been particularly ill with seven demons. Seven, as you know, is a number that symbolizes perfection or fullness in the Bible. And demon possession is a way that the ancients referred to illnesses that today we would give medical names. So what Luke is saying is that Mary was completely ill, but now she is totally well, as she and the other healed women devote themselves to Jesus' mission. While some imagine Mary and her companions cooking and cleaning and sewing for Jesus and the male disciples, the Greek text in Luke 8.3 tells us rather that the women were ministering or diakonating, the Greek verb diakonein, is there, that they were diakonating, ministering out of their monetary resources. The verb diakonein refers to various types of ministry in the Gospel of Luke and in Acts of the Apostles, ministry of the word, ministry of the table, apostolic ministry, and Jesus describes his own ministry with this term. In Mark's Gospel, he says he has come not to be served, diakonethene, but to serve, diakonesai in Mark 10, 45. In the case of Mary, Joanna, and Susanna, Luke specifies what kind of ministry they were doing. He says they were diakonating out of their resources. Now the Greek word huparkanton, resources, means monetary resources. And autais, you did want, you did want a refresher on your Greek <laughs> New Testament, right? The Pronoun autais is feminine plural, a feminine plural possessive pronoun indicating that the money is their own, not the common purse. You remember that in John chapter 12, verse 6, it says that Judas kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. So Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and Susanna are business partners with Jesus, financing the mission and accompanying him as he goes from town to town, and they are participating in the proclamation of the good news. We turn now to the center panel, entitled 
the one sent, Mary Magdalene with Jesus the Christ. And here it shows Mary and Christ, and these are Janet McKenzie and Barbara Marion's words, seated side by side as visionaries and spiritual teachers with their hands open in the universal gesture of prayer, gifts offered and received as icons of the sacred." End quote. This portrayal <clears throat> captures well the way that the Gospel of John portrays Mary Magdalene. In that gospel, Mary Magdalene is not just an individual disciple, but represents the whole community of those who have come to believe in Jesus and who are entrusted by the risen Christ with the mission to proclaim the good news. Chapter 20 of the Gospel of John is one of the most beautiful descriptions of Mary's journey toward being the one sent, an icon of Christ who was the one sent by the Father. In John's Gospel, Mary Magdalene comes alone to the tomb. In the other Gospels, you remember, other Galilean women accompany her. But the fourth evangelist depicts, her, depicts Mary alone as the representative of the community of all the beloved disciples. She comes in the breaking dawn, seeking her beloved, much as the lover in the Song of Songs. She encounters two angels as she looks into the tomb. Why are you weeping, they ask, a question that Jesus himself repeats. She does not recognize him at first and thinks he is the gardener. But when he speaks her name as the good shepherd who calls each of his own by name, she turns and exclaims, Rabuni, my teacher. And Jesus then tells her not to cling to the way that she knew him before. He has returned to the one who sent him. But at the same time, he has also returned to his own, as he promised. And he then sends her to the brothers and sisters, the gathered community of believers, and she faithfully proclaims all that he had told her. As Janet McKenzie captures that climactic moment in that center painting, The One Sent, she paints Mary Magdalene side by side with Jesus the incarnation of his face and hands now in the world. The third panel, entitled Apostle of the Apostles, Mary Magdalene with the Beloved Disciple and Peter, this third panel takes us to the moment when Mary tells the others what Jesus has said to her. At the beginning of John 20, when Mary first found the stone rolled away from the tomb, it was to Peter and the beloved disciple that she ran, telling them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. That's John chapter 20, verse 2. The two of them, Peter and the beloved disciple, had run to the tomb and had seen the wrappings lying there, but they did not see the angels that she did, nor the risen Christ and they returned home. As in many medieval paintings, Janet McKenzie preach, depicts Mary as preacher with the characteristic gesture of forefinger raised toward the heavens proclaiming the resurrection. And as Janet McKenzie and Barbara Marion describe it, Peter is bearing the upside down cross on his robe, alluding to his own future crucifixion but he looks away from Magdalene, refusing to recognize her. The beloved disciple, however, is turned toward her, reflecting his unconditional love and belief. In portraying Peter as rejecting Mary's witness, Janet McKenzie captures the response of the apostles to Mary's proclamation as it is told in the Gospel of Luke. In Luke chapter 24, verse 11, Luke says, the women's words seemed to them as an idle tale, leiros in Greek, which could also be translated nonsense as the New American Bible translates it, and they did not believe them. Now in her depiction of the beloved disciple, Janet McKenzie shows him as male, although the fourth gospel, it, Although in the fourth gospel, the beloved disciple is never identified by name, nor even by gender, male or female. But the symbolism 
of not identifying that beloved disciple allows any one of us to imagine ourselves as the disciple most beloved by Jesus and quickest to believe. That both male and female disciples are an icon of the Christ is well captured in Janet's award-winning painting, Jesus of the People, where here Jesus seems to transcend gender and indeed, as you probably know, she used a female model for this painting. We now turn to Mary, the mother of Jesus. Janet McKenzie and Barbara Marion describe the painting this way. This, this one is Mary with the midwives. Mary's time to deliver has come. Strengthened in the embrace of experienced midwives, she is prepared for the labor and pain of giving birth. The women's eyes are closed in heightened awareness and communion with creative forces within. Lips parted, Mary is exhaling, surrendering her breath and being her breath and being to the divine at work and shining through her as the classic symbol of inspiration and new life hovers above." End quote. The two Gospels that tell of Mary giving birth to Jesus, Matthew and Luke, are very sparse in their details about the birth, and they don't really give us much of a glimpse of Mary's experience. Matthew focuses on Joseph's experience and his dilemma about whether to divorce Mary and and then focuses on the divine assurance that comes to Joseph in dreams. Luke gives us much more of Mary's story, telling us of her response to God at the Annunciation through Gabriel and her experience of blessedness in her visit with Elizabeth. But when it comes to the birth of her child, Luke simply says, while they were there in Bethlehem, the time came for her to deliver her child, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them at the inn. That's in Luke chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. In the Gospel of John, while there is no infancy narrative, there is a theme of birthing that runs throughout the whole Gospel. The mother of Jesus is key to how that theme functions. She appears in two important scenes, at the beginning and the end of the gospel, the story of the wedding feast at Cana in chapter 2 and the crucifixion scene, chapter 19, verses 25 to 27. At Cana, she is the one who is midwife. She who gave Jesus physical birth is now the midwife who helps to birth his public mission. And at the end of the gospel, she is witness to the crucifixion, the completion of Jesus' earthly mission. And along with her sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene, she witnesses the death of her son, which becomes the birthing of the renewed children of God, who will carry on the next phase of his mission. Jesus had told his disciples at the Last Supper how to understand his passion as birth pangs that must be gone through to bring forth new life, but he pointed them toward the joy that would come with what was being born and assured them that like a mother giving birth, the joy would lead them to forget the labor pains. That's in John chapter 16, verses 20 to 21. So Jesus' mother, Mary Magdalene, and the other women at the cross are the midwives of this new life that is being birthed. Jesus' mother in this gospel is never named. And as with the anonymous beloved disciple, every disciple, male and female, is invited to be one who gives birth to the Christ and to be midwife of his mission. In Janet McKenzie's and Barbara Marion's words, Mary with the midwives invites women everywhere to the awareness and naming of their own labor to bring new life to others as the act of giving birth to the divine in their babies, their work, their art, and in their care of the earth through the support, facilitation, and advocacy of other women." End quote. 
Lastly, we come to Epiphany. Matthew's is the only gospel that recounts the story of the Magi, the exotic ones who come from the east to Jerusalem, asking, where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? They had observed his star at its rising, and they came to pay him homage. That's in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. The term magi originally referred to a caste of Persian priests who served their king. They were not themselves kings or wise men, but were adept at interpreting dreams. In Matthew's Gospel, they appear to be astrologers who can interpret the movement of the stars. These foreigners symbolize the inclusion of all people, Jews and Gentiles, in the Jesus movement. The biblical text does not say how many magi there were or exactly where they came from. The traditional number of three magi is derived from the three gifts they bear, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. <clears throat> In Janet McKenzie's painting, as you can see, the magi are women. And indeed, not all magi in antiquity were male. And my colleague Singe Yang at Chicago Theological Seminary has made a good case for reading the Magi in Matthew's Gospel as female. But I'll let her share her work with you in a forthcoming article. Also related, Magi brought the myrrh. Also related is that there are many renditions of the icon, the myrrh bearers, depicting women who went to the tomb of Christ carrying myrrh and other spices to anoint his dead body. In the Orthodox Church, they are called apostles to the apostles, the first preachers of the resurrection. This icon is the patronal icon of the Holy Myrrh Bearers Monastery in Otigo, New York, and depicts seven of the women named in the Gospels, Mary Magdalene, Mary the wife of Clophus, Joanna, Salome the mother of the sons of Zebedee, Susanna, Mary the sister of Lazarus, and Martha the sister of Lazarus. Lazarus. Barbara Marion describes Epiphany thus, wise women throughout time and in every culture know themselves to be seekers and seers of the divine. In Janet McKenzie's interpretation of the Magi, women around the world find an image of the Epiphany that includes and validates their encounters with the one who saves, celebrated here in the powerful, protective, and tender manifestation of a mother and her child, embraced and nurtured by a loving community. Here is global inclusiveness and a vision of mutuality and interdependence, the giving and receiving of the three gifts essential to life itself, presence, love, and daily bread. Epiphany proclaims again and anew, Christ for all people, God's favor extends to all." End quote. We are profoundly grateful for these paintings, which invite us to enter more deeply into the mystery of our loving God as imaged in female form. This beautiful triptych, the succession of Mary Magdalene, captures the highlights of the biblical story of Mary and opens up our imaginations about her apostolic ministry, beyond the false images that still prevail. Mary and the Midwives is an invitation to all to give birth to Christ's life in our world and to be midwives of his mission. Epiphany invites us to stretch our tent pegs ever wider to receive the stranger as the bearer of gifts necessary for the flourishing of all. With Pope Francis's visit to the U.S. concluding today, I am reminded of his insistence in his apostolic letter, Evangelii Gaudium, in paragraph number 103, he says that there is a need for, quote, a more incisive female presence in the church, end quote. We know that women have always been present and ministering in the church in powerful and prophetic ways. 
Janet McKenzie's paintings are a visual testimony of this, for which we are so deeply grateful. Thank you.